how's it going med terminology and welcome to my video lecture so instead of me looking at one body system and like finding three different papers on it i decided to look at the chemical called capsaicin and kind of look at how it affects the different organs as it goes through your body so capsaicin is the main component for that heat that you get when you eat a pepper or some hot sauce Capsaicin is interesting because it's believed to have been evolved as a deterrent from mammals and insects, but birds actually are immune to the heat. They get no painful response from eating peppers, and that way they can facilitate seed dispersion, and uh, the bright colors of the peppers will actually attract the birds to come eat it and spread the seeds. The way we measure the heat or spiciness of a food is actually using something called the Scoville test. So this was invented back in 1912 by a guy named Wilbur Scoville. And what all he did was dilute pepper extract and sugar water uh, until the heat was no longer detectable by a panel of five judges. And this was a rough science and not that accurate because some people just taste heat differently. And then also... If you're there having those taste tests all day long, uh, there, you get the sensory fatigue, and it, it wasn't that accurate. Later in 1970, a scientist by the name of Gillett came along and used HPLC, which is high-performance liquid chromatography, to measure capsaicin by the parts per million. And what he found out is one part per million equaled a 16 on the Scoville scale. He figured out there's a, a linear relationship where if you take parts per million, times it by 16, you get your Scoville scale for that sample. We still use the Scoville scale today to measure capsaicin in food items and just measure capsaicin in general. So here we have a table. Pure capsaicin is going to be 16 million on the scale. Uh, below that we have police pepper spray, which is uh, 5 million 300. The highest grade pepper spray that they use, the pepper spray that you would buy from a store as a normal deterrent is usually about 2 million. So it's still high up there, but considerably lower. Next on the list, we have Carolina Reaper, which is a pepper that was bred for the purpose of being the hottest pepper in the world. It is non-organic. Growers and scientists basically invented this pepper uh, through selective breeding. Below that, you can see the Butch Jolokia, which I know I'm saying wrong, but that's the ghost pepper. Everybody's heard about the ghost pepper. They put ghost pepper on everything. It's an internet thing. Uh, below that, I have the Scotch Bonnet, which is the hottest pepper I've ever eaten and the seventh hottest organic pepper in the world. It was painful, trust me. Then we have the Tabasco, pep the Tabasco pepper, which everybody's, everybody's had Tabasco sauce. Uh, the Jalapeno, and then... Tabasco sauce itself, which is very low, a measly 2,500. So as far as how we get exposed to capsaicin, the number one way is definitely ingestion. Duh, it's, it's a food item. Uh, but we can also have dermal contact where you're cutting up some peppers and it gets on your skin, or it can touch your eyes, same way. Uh, and then the last one is inhalation. This one normally only occurs from people getting pepper sprayed. So once capsaicin enters our GI tract, it can be absorbed by the jejunum in the GI tract and it enters the hepatic for, uh, portal veins, so it heads into your bloodstream. Uh, it is readily transported by a non-active pro process, which means it, it doesn't need any transport proteins, it doesn't need anything to help it enter your bloodstream, it can do it by itself. It just it, it readily moves through membranes. The reason for that is because capsaicin is actually a uh, fat-soluble molecule. It's able to move right through our uh, cell membranes. It's, it's able to move around in your body very easily. All right, so for my first paper, it is called The Metabolism of Capsaicin by Cytochrome P450 Produces Novel Degradation Metabolites and Increases Cytotoxicity in Lung and Liver Cells. Uh, we'll get into what exactly that all means. But cytochrome P450 is a group of enzymes that our liver has that we use to break down uh, medications. And it, it's the general thing that our body sends out to attack uh, toxins as they're detected. 
This paper reports that the metabolization of capsaicin is 100% dependent on cytochrome P450. If we didn't have that enzyme available, we would not be able to metabolize it whatsoever. The cytochrome P450 will metabolize the capsaicin in nine different ways, M1 through M9. So all of these are possible, but the three that happen the most are M1, M3, and M4. The ones that occur the least are M8 and M9. Uh, those are the most interesting ones because they are actually shown to inhibit the activity of cytochrome P450. So if too much of those occur, they can kind of stop the breakdown of more capsaicin entering the liver. Um, but they, the authors aren't 100% sure how that worked. They think it's because they're electrophilic, uh, but it, they basically said more research needs to be done on this. It's interesting. So as of the time of this study, uh, there was no actual data for how much of the like capsaicin we ingest do we uh, eliminate through feces. So this study did show us that about 10% of the ingested capsaicin was passed through the rats unchanged, while uh, about 50% of the ingested capsaicin was passed to hamsters unchanged. So this difference is most likely due to the size and activity of the liver. Rats have much larger lif livers per body size, while hamsters are much smaller. Humans are most likely to be somewhere in the middle, uh, there still hasn't been a study focusing on humans. As far as how we eliminate it, 99.5% of capsaicin and its metabolites are passed through feces. Uh, l less than 1% is passed through the urinary tract, and that is due to the non-water solubility of capsaicin, and all the metabolites are not water-soluble. So now going back to what I said when I read the title, uh, metabolites M8 and M9, which are uh, on the left side, those are the ones that will actually inhibit the activity of cytochrome P450 enzymes and kind of reduce your ability to deal with other toxins. Uh, but it's very minor, it's very short how long this happens. Not really anything you need to worry about as far as eating spicy foods. Uh, it's just an interesting little tidbit that they discovered. My second paper is Topical Capsaicin for Pain Management, Therapeutic Potential, and Mechanisms of Action for High Concentrate Capsaicin Patches. Basically, this is the paper that goes in depth on how capsaicin affects nerve cells. The way they found out that these patches work is they defunctionalize certain aspects of the nerve cell and will kind of lower the ability to send pain signals. As you can see from this picture from the paper, capsaicin kind of goes in and does a lot of weird things in the cell. Uh, first, it can latch onto the TRPV1 protein and cause more calcium to enter the cell. Uh, it will also mess with the endoplastic reticulum, making even more calcium enter the cell that's stored up. And it will raise the calcium to sodium ratio from 8 to 1 up to 25 to 1. This increased calcium causes a breakdown of the cytoskeleton and it will interrupt the fast axion transport. So it slows down kind of the nerve cell communication. So this kind of gives a sense of pain relief because you're not getting as much pain signals coming through. This is all a limited thing. None of this damages the nerve cell. Uh, nothing's long-term. So this is all temporary. None of these changes will last. Uh, capsaicin doesn't do any real damage to the nerve cell. It just is an inhibitor for a short amount of time until it gets knocked off by something else. And then for my third and final paper, we have the effect of capsaicin on substrate oxidation and weight maintenance after modest body weight loss in human subjects. So the purpose of this paper was to kind of assess whether capsaicin does help with weight loss. Uh, there's Facebook articles that I've found which basically say eat spicy food, it increases your metabolism and will help you lose weight. Uh, so this paper kind of went out to prove that right or wrong. 
the way they set up the study was by having a one month period of a very low energy diet along with moderate to high energy exercise and then a three month period where uh, people were to return to normal diets uh, during that first month everybody lost about 75 kilograms and then during the three months they slowly gained some of it back uh, the placebo group and the capsaicin group had almost no difference between the two of them. Uh, the weight regain was pretty even. Uh, they both groups regained about two and a half uh, kilograms back to where they were. There was one noticeable difference. The capsaicin group had higher fat oxidation levels compared to the placebo group. Now, that doesn't mean that they were burning uh, fat better or they were doing anything different. It just means the fat was getting oxidized, so it was more ready to become burned and eliminated from the body. Uh, that's interesting because maybe long term, if they continue to study up for over a year, they would see a difference between the placebo group and the capsaicin group. But as far as the study went, there was no real significance for taking capsaicin to try to lose weight quicker. That concludes my video presentation on capsaicin and how it affects the body. I hope you learned something uh, maybe you enjoyed. Bye.